Good morning. Good morning. So great to see you all once again. Welcome back to this community conversation. I am Al Moore, Senior Advisor and Owner of Al Moore Financial. You can find me at Al Moore Financial on Facebook and at Al Moore Financial on other socials. I am so glad to be back with you all today. Um, can you believe it's February already? We are in the second week of February, uh, second week of Black History Month. Um, so I hope this message finds you all well and happy. Uh, we've had some rain here, so it's been kind of dreary on our end, but Super Bowl Sunday is coming up. Um, so one of the few times of the year where we'll have 30-second, $2 million commercial spots. Um, this is just some uh, finance, economy, uh, tidbit information that always uh, is just kind of exciting or interesting to me um, whenever there's big transactions going on um, in the Super Bowl, just the weekend of itself, you know, you're looking at, you know, close to a, a billion dollars changing hands over that weekend when you look at ad revenue and the cost of production and ticket sales and tourism sales, you know, the Super Bowl is uh, one, one of the biggest weekends for the American economy. So, um, I just always like to sit back and look at some of the the spending reports that comes out um, just to see, you know, what it did for that city, um, kind of the the boost, how much money was spent, all that kind of stuff. I, I love kind of being nosy and, and, and looking at uh, counting other people's pockets, as they say, to see, you know, exactly how much money was, was spent uh, or made during that time. So glad to be back with you all. Um, since we last spoke, we're going to go ahead and get into our first segment. Uh, so what's been going on lately? Uh, this week, um, we had a address from our, our president. President Biden gave his State of the Union address, and he spoke to a couple of things um, just as far as finance and uh, the economy goes. And things that kind of stuck out to me. I was kind of looking or waiting to see if there would be any big talk on Social Security, uh, any big changes coming down the pike. Uh, I don't think we're going to see anything anytime soon. Um, so Social Security changes seem to be safe for now. Uh, another thing he touched on uh, was inflation. Uh, according to the uh, the numbers that came out in December, uh, the inflation had gone down to 6.5% in uh, December. And I think the high was around 8% in June of 2022. So uh, that leads us to believe that the Fed's um, practice of kind of tightening up the economy, raising up those interest rates, um, which seems to be what they're committed to doing. Um, it's not the first time we've seen this. We saw this uh, back in the 80s when inflation was out of control and mortgage rates and everything were sky high. They kind of just said, let's want to tighten everything up, make borrowing money so, so, so expensive to try to slow things down, bring prices back down. And it's painful in the process, but um, it seems to be the best solution, or at least the Fed thinks the best solution in terms of what can ultimately um, get us back to a, a, a good number in terms of inflation. Um, and to that, uh, just some Fed reports kind of coming out. It doesn't seem like they're going to start to lower the interest rate anytime soon. If anything, we might be looking at another hike um, within the next, within the coming months, or at least for, you know, solid 2023, they haven't ruled out the idea of uh, more continuing hikes, um, maybe getting the rate up to around, because they said 5.1%. Um, because they saw what they'd done last quarter of the year, they said, we think this is continuing in the right direction. So we're going to hold that that interest rate tight, keep the cost of borrowing uh, expensive so that we can kind of drain some of this money, um, get some of this money out, out, out of the economy and kind of slow things down because we're, we're, we're going wayward. I want to get back under control. So with that, um, you're going to continue to see things like uh, banks and CD rates, which are until the last year, which have been a complete waste of time, but now you will see some of those banks and CD rates offering, you know, two or three percent for savings. You know, there may even be some four and five percent CDs sitting out there uh, for six months. 
Uh, nothing long term too too impressive. I wouldn't go and hop in a a four percent seven year CD uh, at a bank um, unless you're at that stage of life where you know you're just kind of you're in retirement. Um, but if you're under fifty years old, uh, you're still working. You want to play the the CD and savings account game, put a little bit more of your your assets there. It's understandable. Um, I wouldn't get too, too crazy, wouldn't fall too much in love with it because, like I said, those things uh, can change as as the Fed uh, changes its mind about interest rates. So, um, but a- as of now, you know, the terms for a lot of those fixed products don't look horrible. Um, not to say that they're great, but they don't look as horrible as they did, let's say, you know, two or three years ago um, when they're, you know, paying you around 1%. And so, Maybe getting things in the mail or driving by banks or even just scrolling the internet and seeing, hey, you know, ABC Bank online savings account opening up today or three percent return. So I mean, you know, it's nothing to write home about, but those things are significant in terms of uh, if you want to just put your cash somewhere where you're drawing a little bit of interest. But like I said, um, the great Warren Buffett always advises us to be greedy when people are scared. And to be scared when people agree. And right now, a good percentage of people are scared. And, um, you know, the market last year had one of its worst years in quite some time. So a lot of people are going to cash. There's a ton of cash sitting out, which means that the prices of, you know, companies, investing in companies, stocks, equities, whatever you want to call it, ETFs, mutual funds, those things have lowered as people have started going to cash. But um institutional investors are, are still continuing to buy the like i say we'll get into that the dollar cost average is always going to win um if anything now you know it's just also the stock market is one of the few places where when things go on sale people don't buy it but, um in any other time you know you walk into any other place and something was 40 percent off you know people would snatch it up but for some reason that same train of thought doesn't um, occur in the stock market when it should. There's definitely some people taking advantage of uh, some cheaper prices now. And um, I'm, I'm willing to say that long term, uh, there'll be a substantial reward for that. So uh, just shifting to our second segment of uh, things you need to know. We're going to be talking today about getting started investing and like, where do I start? Um, so one of the more common questions that I get um just in my practice and and day to day just people uh saying you know al i I want to get started investing i don't know where to start or do i have enough money or um i don't know what to invest in and for people so of course my 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 professional and personal opinion is um you should always want to talk to an advisor um even if you are planning to go the the uh, the DIY route. If you plan to to invest yourself and in, and in your own investments, I would still say starting out, but want to talk to an advisor, um, just because they have certain expertise and certain experience about things that um will, will be a benefit to you when starting out on that journey. Um, but the the process of investing is taking complex ideas. And really break them down in the steps. The same way with most things. Uh, it's a it's a process of reverse engineering. Um, but in order to properly do it, you have to first have a conceptual understanding of where it is that you want to go, where it is that you want to end up. So um, there are three main things to pay attention to when you're first getting started. Um just in terms of where do I start and what do I invest in, I, I'll tell anybody this. There are three things that kind of make up what you should be invested in. And of course, everyone's personal investment philosophy and strategy should be different. So I wouldn't dare come on and say, this is where you should start um, and start naming individual companies because that's all based on an individual basis. But what I can tell you is this. The three things that you want to 
No, when you get started, it's one, your time horizon. That is either your time to invest to when you retire or just the time from when you start to invest to when you'll need that money that you invested. So time horizon is one. And that makes up 80% of what you should be invested in. You know, that seems like a big chunk. Like, wow, 80% of what I should be investing in is based on my time horizon? Absolutely. It absolutely is. So what's the other 20%? The other two, another 10% should be your budget. What can you afford realistically? What can you set up a system to contribute to or to purchase on a routine basis? How much from your budget after you've taken care of your living expenses? Um, how much do you have allocated towards saving or investing each month? Or each quarter, if you want to purchase each quarter, but you need to have an amount budgeted each month, even if you just purchase quarterly or semi-annually or whatever the case may be. But you want to do it on a routine basis. But that makes up 10% of what you should be invested in. The last 10% is your risk tolerance. It's not something that necessarily is on the top of people's mind. But your risk tolerance, which just means what your your appetite for what you can handle, because we're human, we like to open accounts and check them every day, check them every five minutes, every time something happens on the news. Oh, let me go to my Fidelity account. Let me go to my Robinhood account. Let me go to my uh, E-Trade account, SkyTrade, and see what happens, which is one of the worst things you could do. Uh, but for a lot of DIYers, uh, people who like to do it themselves, um, they get caught in the, the, the copious task of having to see what their investment account is doing each day. And I can tell you from personal and professional experience, the worst thing you can do is check your investment account hourly or, 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 or daily or sometimes even, even weekly, you know, I, if you want to check it, you know, Monday and then Friday, fine. I would suggest maybe once a week kind of look at it if you want to look at it. But you can typically, if you have a deal, if you have a strong financial plan in place, checking your investment account monthly when you when you make them purchases, um, that's sufficient. Because with your financial the strong financial plan, you're planning out for years. So I try to tell my clients that the, we're not getting started on an idea that we're going to need solved next week. Because if that's the case, I'm probably not the, not the advisor for you. If we're coming up with a financial plan, that means we're having years to work, to solidify, to invest, to reallocate, to to reweight ourselves, moving toward a goal, and we're anticipating ups and downs in the market, and we're tailoring our purchase process in accordance to that. So, in terms of where do I start, where do I need to invest in, the three things that you need to consider, time horizon, that's 80%. Budget, 10%, risk tolerance, 10%. Those three things will tell me as an advisor what you should be invested in. And once you start to understand investments, you will say, okay, hey, my time horizon here is the most key thing about what I can be invested in because that will help me level set to what kind of return and in what kind of timeline I can expect the return. And then my budget, can I afford what I, what I think I'm looking for in my risk tolerance, am I going to flip a lid when I check the news, when I check my account after watching the news and I'm down 8% one day? Um, so those are the three things that you have to uh, take into account when we're talking about um, where we're getting started. Another thing to consider when we're getting started 
is working towards diversification. Now, the stock market mainly has 11 sectors. Um, some people say 12, uh, they consider cash a sector, but a sector is just a, a industry or a, a type, an area of certain types of companies. So one is tech. Um, you know, those are tech companies, things like Apple, Google, such, uh, healthcare. Those are pharmaceutical companies, things of that nature. Uh, in the third sector, you have financials. Those are big banks, you know, investment companies, things like that. Um, uh, then fourth, you have consumer discretionary. These are things that people buy. Um, a lot of times are luxury brands. Um, keyword here being discretionary. These are things that, you know, people don't necessarily need, but they buy them uh, frequently within the market, but they're not necessarily vital to life. So think of a lot of retail brands, communication services, companies, you know, you think about your cell phones, AT&T, Verizon, things of that nature. Uh, then you have industrials. Industrials, think of construction companies, people who build things, or companies that make things that are used in the um, process of uh, industrial or construction, things of that nature. Then you have consumer staples. Consumer staples are things that people need. They have to buy things like grocery stores, groceries, uh, tissues, anything that's that's vital that you go to the grocery store that you have to have. You know, people are going to the grocery store um, in good and bad times. People are going to Walmart, Dollar Tree, and good or bad times. These are what we call consumer staples, or some people call them uh, consumer defensive. That means that when things go bad, like these areas tend to uh, uh, coagulate, become stronger in down economies. Uh, the next sector is energy. Uh, think about oil, gas companies, things like that. Companies who are in the industry of uh, processing things to to provide energy to 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 the provide power. Um, next is utilities. Utilities, you know, things like water companies, uh, electric companies, uh, where you pay your bills to. Uh, there's a sector uh, to invest in utilities. Next is uh, real estate, self-explanatory, uh, commercial, residential, housing. Um, not only housing, but commercial real estate for building malls or hospitals or anything with, with land and a what they call real property upon that uh, uh physical physical structure to which can have a mortgage, you know, real estate. And the last is materials. Uh you know, it's raw materials that are think about things that are mined out of the earth or having to be processed or refined. Uh materials as a sector. So um uh, a well diversified portfolio is going to have an allotment or an allocation to all those 11 industries, to all those 11 industries or sectors. So you want to work toward diversify yourself in such a way. And the, the reason why diversification, diversifying your portfolio is important is because the market is cyclical. So that means the four sectors are doing well, four or five sectors might be down. And so you want to have your money allocated in a way that when you don't have all your eggs in one basket. So if financials and consumer discretionary are down or energies and utilities are up and doing good. So you want to just have a, a balanced outlook in your portfolio. And then as you become more seasoned and then you can kind of weight it towards certain times in the economy to say, okay, well, I feel that at this time, these sectors are going to start doing well, and that's what we get into rebalancing and, and reallocating um, just to make sure that your portfolio thrives. So you want to see what your time horizon is, what your budget is, what your risk tolerance is, and what you kind of assess those things, and you're ready to get started. You want to kind of find companies that you understand or that you're familiar with uh, across those, those industries. And... Um, Next, you just want to make sure that you have a consistent contribution plan to your retirement account or to your investment account. I tell people all the time, consistently contributing to your investment account is more important than buying at the right time. 
Listen, if your dollar cost average, you know, it prevents you from buying at the top. So that's why earlier when I talked about, you know, having a plan to make those purchases, the most important thing you can do for yourself is allocate a budget out to go to your investment account that you don't even have to touch. You can automate it and where you can buy. You also want to, when you're getting started, you want to have your dividends set up to where they're reinvesting for you. So that way, when a company pays you out a little dividend, instead of you taking that cash and spending it, you can reinvest it and say, hey, I want to take whatever dividend you want to pay me. And I want to reinvest it to you all to buy, you know, some more shares of a company or a part of the share. Um, and that way, you know, it kind of allows you to purchase shares without spending your own money. Um, and next, uh, a lot of things people talk about how much should I buy at one time? Um, I tell people, a lot of advisors will say you should buy in lots of 100. If you can't buy 100 shares of a company at a time, you need to buy uh, into more, into less cost prohibitive companies or cheaper companies. Or you can start in mutual funds uh, or ETFs. Um, the, the honest part about it is buying two or three or one share of something at a time. You're kind of just spinning your wheels. And you can take that money and put it into a, a mutual fund and you'll have, you'll be able to get into more companies um, and have that and have access to that manager of that fund. You'll be doing yourself more of a service than you would be just buying, you know, eight, nine, three or four shares or something at a time. So you want to get yourself positioned to where you can say, hey, I can buy 50 shares at this time. Or I can buy 100 shares at this every time. Or if not, I'm going to invest in funds and mutual funds and ETFs until I can build up my way uh, to be able to buy those, you know, 50 or 100 shares. OK, so uh, a good advisor always, I forget the guy's name. It's, it's Jim something, but he said the two biggest mistakes in investing. One is not starting. And the second is not going all in. And that doesn't mean throwing all your money into the stock market. It just means not consistently sticking to a plan, you know, not not going all in on the, on the financial plan or the investment strategy that you set up for yourself. And so um, that brings us to our third segment. Uh, there's a book on that. When I got started out, uh, just kind of in, investing on my own and, just trying to understand, I wanted to get a good concept of how I could better understand companies and their, and their balance sheets and certain technical analysis. And so I just started, you know, reading um, certain books on how I could be more efficient at that. One book that I like that I still reference today uh, is uh, Walk Down Wall Street. It's an older book. But I think they have a revised version of it. So you kind of have to account for changes in technology and, and language, but the principles of the book are still good just for me in terms of when I was looking to learn how to understand better, uh, how to understand companies' financials better. That that, that really um, is something that I refer to um, that's really has some good information there. But, you know, keep your phone near to Google certain words and familiarize yourself with them. And the more you see them, the more you become comfortable with it. Like I said, the, uh, investing is, a, is very much a marathon and not a sprint. So um, get comfortable with being unfamiliar with terms. And the more you see them, the more they'll come familiar to you. And you'll look up one day like, man, I really understand, you know, beta coefficient. And I had no idea what that meant six months ago. So, yeah. And uh, lastly, you know, our fourth segment here, we talk about um, the common question for the week. And the common question I've been getting a lot lately is, hey, Al, like what? What sectors or what areas, you know, have historically done well during recessions? And just according to uh, history and, and information, uh, the utilities, energy, and the consumer staple sectors have fared better on average overall doing downturns in the economy than the other eight sectors. So uh, that's not necessarily, you know, direct investment advice. You know, that's just a, that's just an assessment of, of history. Um, you know, like I said earlier, even in down economy, people are going to continue to pay their utilities. You know, people are going to continue to need energy and they're still going to be buying groceries. So 
from a common sense standpoint, it makes sense that those three would um, be solid um, during a recession. Like I said, to perform well during a recession or down economy doesn't mean much. It just might mean the other sectors were down 9% and these were just down one. They performed better um, and sometimes they're up. So uh, that's just something to uh, look into, do some history on um, and kind of understand why those things ebb and flow. Um, so that as you're going on this financial journey, you'll kind of have be braced for um, certain volatilities. Like I said, always, always, always consult a professional when getting started. You know, sit down and talk to a CPA, sit down and talk to a financial advisor to just say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. You know, do you have any suggestions or can you point me in the right direction of some good information? And that's what they're there for. They're there to to help you. And so. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been such a pleasure. It looks like we've run up on time again. This time just goes so fast with you all. But I'm so, 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 so glad that um, we were able to spend some time together. And uh, I'm not sure if you're rooting for the, the Eagles or the Chiefs this weekend in the Super Bowl, but good luck to you. I'm a Steelers fan, and we were nowhere close this year. So hopefully next year um, – will will be will be a better competition. Who knows? Maybe even we'll be at the big day on Sunday. But um again, another week here. Um going over just some big picture investing stuff. Again, we want to thank uh, the good people of KLA K L E K uh for all the things they've done. They've got a lot of Black History Month programming going on. So be sure to check those people out. And again, um hope that you all are in the best of mind, body and spirit. Thank you so much for joining me. Until next time, I will see you all later. Be well. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Al Moore. I'm the senior advisor and owner of Al Moore Financial. My apologies for not being able to be there with you all. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Al Moore. I'm the senior advisor and owner of Al Moore Financial. My apologies for not being able to be there with you all physically today, but I did want to take a moment out to introduce myself and send you a message. First, I just wanted to say thank you to What the Doula and the wonderful, wonderful Ms. Kayla Matthews, who's been a blessing to me as well as my family, being a doula for my son and being such such a supportive, uh, instrumental part of the birthing process with my wife and I. And I know that you all have enjoyed this yoga session. And I just want to take some time to say that for Valentine's Day coming up, love, expression, self-care, and family are at the top of people's mind. And what better way to show that love, expression to your family than to make sure that they're financially taken care of with proper financial planning and insurance.